Okay, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And we praise the Lord for what he's already done at our conference. Uh, it is my extreme pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker. He's an elder here at Fellowship Bible Chapel. Pastor Mike Clapham teaches the Power to Stand class with me and, and others. And I want to go ahead and tell you the subject matter that he'll be dealing with right, right alongside what uh, Dr. Randall brought this morning, the Day of the Lord. Elements of that, obviously, not pleasant. Very heavy language in the scriptures about this coming days of calamity, but the result will be a beautiful thing, a restoration of God's people. Pastor Mike has taught an eight-week series on our YouTube channel on the Day of the Lord and various concepts relating to that. To me, one of the best, concise, clear treatments of the key passages about the Day of the Lord in the scriptures that I've ever heard and sat under. All eight sessions are online. You need to go to the FB Chapel YouTube and watch Pastor Mike Clapham's Power to Stand series on the Day of the Lord. You will be blessed. And I know we're going to be blessed today. Brother, come on up. I'm going to pray for you. Father, we pray once again that you will be honored and glorified in this session. Thank you for Pastor Mike. We thank you for his ministry here at Fellowship Bible. And uh, Lord, I anticipate today another clear, emboldened presentation in the power of your spirit about this important topic. Thank you for Israel. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your character and nature and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just in case. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Appreciate that prayer and appreciate the opportunity to minister with you the Word of God in power to stand. Randy Smith is my friend. We did not collaborate on what we were speaking on this morning. And our messages overlap so much, one might think that we prepared them at the same time in the same room. Now, for some people, that would be like horrifying because I'm going to be sharing some of the things that, that, that Randy put so, so forcefully and uh, so powerfully uh, in, in the first session this morning. But for me, it's, it's like a liberation because he captured for us in the first half of Joel chapter 2 the essence of the day of the Lord as it relates to the nation of Israel. And, and in, in effect, what he's done for me, let me put it this way. Can I speak plainly with you? Um, I am I'm going to speak in terms that I don't I don't want you to be offended on any level. I'm I'm sharing transparently here. But I am a white man. Do you understand that? Even when I played basketball, even when I was athletic, even when I was an athlete, I could not jump. And on March the 31st, of, of this year, Dr. Burlett in Westerville, Ohio, performed major reconstructive surgery on my right ankle and my right foot to repair my right ankle and foot so that when I need an ankle replacement in 10 years or so, my joint will be able to accept it. I can't jump at all off my right foot now. If I jump, I have to jump totally off my left foot. So. I'm not getting off the ground, but what Randy did for me in the first hour was he set the stage, and I've got a basketball, and I'm going onto a court with a six-foot rim. You understand what that means, right? I can two-hand reverse standing up, and, and I just appreciate so much uh, what he did and, and what he shared. In preparing for, for this message, 
uh, I, I originally um, gave my wife the references for the slides uh, early on Thursday morning. And I thought the message was totally done. And I ended up actually redoing the message yesterday morning. Same slides, but a slightly different emphasis. This morning at 3.30, the Spirit of God woke me up, and I was wide awake. And, you know, this doesn't happen, you know, all the time. But when it happens, I've learned to recognize it's the Spirit of God. And I'm supposed to go to the Bible and look at what I'm going to share. And it really is incredible to me that, that the Spirit of God laid on my heart the things that he did in order to complement what Randy shared from the first half of Joel 2 this morning. I need to tell you a little bit about myself as I introduce this message. I moved back to Columbus, Ohio in late August of 2002. Since that time, my life has been significantly impacted by the teaching ministry of five different men. Chuck Missler, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Randy Smith, Jacob Prash, and another man I'll name in a few minutes. Two of them have ministered at FBC this month. Last weekend, we benefited from the teaching of Jacob Prash. This weekend, we're being blessed by the keynote speaker of our 2016 Columbus Bible Prophecy Conference, Dr. Randy Smith. Their teaching styles and personalities could not be more different. And those of you who were here last week know and understand what I'm talking about. Love and respect both men. Even though their styles and personalities are like this, they do share some important things in common. They both have a high view of Scripture. They both recognize that the Bible ultimately has been authored by the Spirit of God, and it is a supernatural book, which is inerrant, infallible, and authoritative for faith and practice. And that the Spirit of God used human authors in order to write down the individual books of the Bible. Randy and Jacob also understand that the Bible is a thoroughly Jewish book, which must be understood in light of primarily Jewish human authorship and Jewish culture. These five men have motivated me to study the Word of God these past 14 years. I've been studying the topic of the Day of the Lord for the last five years, ever since I read Jacob's book, Shadows of the Beast, which was published in 2011. In August of 2009, I was marked by 90 seconds of a two-hour presentation that Randy Smith gave about a mile south of here, down the road, at the clubhouse of a local condo development. When he taught on the Bible, I believe it was on a Tuesday night, spoke for two hours, did not come up for air, nobody moved, and in the, in the very beginning, it, it was almost as though he was... Uh, you know, speaking an aside. He mentioned a particular topic, a particular subject that, that he entitles the, the two marriages. And he only spoke about the two marriages for a minute and a half. And for five minutes afterwards, I'm still writing about the two marriages because my head is exploding with theological dots being connected by the summary statement that Randy had just given. 
Those kinds of things have happened to me these past 14 years to help me understand how the Bible fits together. And, and I thank God for Jacob, and I thank God for Randy. Now, of these five men, I was introduced to two of them, namely Chuck Missler and Jacob Presh, by John Haller. And John, I want to tell you, I'm in your debt, brother, because you ministered to me through them. Which leads me to my topic for this morning. Israel and the day of the Lord. The Bible uses the concept of the day of the Lord in several different ways, and, and Randy has uh, touched on uh, some of those already. But for our purposes in this session, I will focus primarily on the eschatological or future use of the day of the Lord, especially as it relates to God's plan and program for Israel. I've found in my own experience that typically when, when teachers and preachers present the day of the Lord, the focus is on the judgment of God against an unbelieving, rebellious, and thoroughly unrepentant humanity. And while that is an important emphasis highlighted throughout Scripture, I would like to focus our attention today on a lesser known aspect of the day of the Lord, namely how God will use this period of time to ultimately affect his will for the remnant nation of Israel. So let's begin our consideration with the prophet Seth Anya. And Randy will have to help me with my pronunciation later. But that is the Hebrew for the prophet Zephaniah. So turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 1. Zephaniah chapter 1. I'm going to simply read the first three verses so that you can understand the backdrop and the big picture and the scope of this book, which contains three chapters. The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. This is not a regionally focused book of the Bible. This is a globally focused book of the Bible because it's, main emphasis is on the eschatological day of the Lord. Look at verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near, for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated His guests. It's reminiscent of Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, when John records for us that with the opening of, with the opening of the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. I believe these two passages are connected. And then we have the description in Zephaniah chapter 14, or excuse me, Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. And it is hauntingly reminiscent of Joel chapter 2, verse 1, and the first half of verse 2. Let me read these verses for you. Near is the great day of the Lord, near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of the Lord. Let me read that again. Listen, the day of the Lord. In it the warrior cries out bitterly. 
A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and the high corner towers. Now, I find it interesting that this language is used. Notice the words that Zephaniah uses in order to describe this future day of the Lord. Wrath, trouble, distress, destruction, desolation, darkness, gloom, clouds, and thick darkness. And he also mentions a day of trumpet and battle cry. And it's a trumpet that is giving warning. It's sounding an alarm. Just like the trumpet in Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Now, I don't think it's any accident that the Old Testament, when it emphasizes the Feast of Trumpets, which is the fifth of seven feasts of the Lord, that it is paired with the Day of the Lord in key passages. I believe that the Feast of Trumpets, a feast which has yet to be fulfilled by the the person and work and ministry of Jesus Christ, will be fulfilled by Him in the day of the Lord as it relates to the nation of Israel. Now, This passage gives for us the first of five characteristics of the day of the Lord. The first characteristic is that it is a time of warning. And this time of warning is indicated by the sounding of a trumpet. Which brings me to the fifth man that I have been impacted by these past 14 years with a renewed study of the Word of God and a desire to learn the Jewish nature and background of this book. And that man is named Marvin Rosenthal. And in 1997, he co-authored this book entitled The Feast of the Lord. Marvin, for uh, 16 years, was the head of the Friends of Israel ministry. And for the past 25 years, He's headed up a ministry that's known as Zion's Fire. I've personally sat under his teaching, and I've found him to be an excellent teacher of the Word of God. Now, I mention his book, The Feast of the Lord, simply because Pastor Steve has asked me to do another series in Power to Stand. And this time, it's not going to be eight weeks, it's going to be seven weeks. And we're going to take a look at the seven feasts of Yahweh and how each one of them are a picture of the ministry and work of Jesus Christ. The four spring feasts have already been fulfilled. The three fall feasts have yet to be fulfilled and will be fulfilled at some point during the 70th seven of Daniel. So let's look at another passage in Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. But before I read those three verses, let me go go ahead and read verses 17 and 18 of chapter 1 just to connect the two. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like done. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath and all the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy for he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one of all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, if you're in the habit of marking your Bibles, I would encourage you to underline all the inhabitants of the earth. I believe that's a technical phrase, a technical phrase that, that John picked up on 
when he describes the inhabitants of the earth in the book of the Revelation. It's used nine different times in the book of the Revelation, and in each case, it's describing unbelieving, unrepentant people who have taken the mark of the beast and are experiencing the judgment of God during the day of the Lord. It's going to be a terrifying one for all the unbelieving, unrepentant, rebellious inhabitants of the earth. That's what that phrase refers to from a biblical point of view. So let's shift gears now and focus our attention on chapter 2. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, what I find interesting is that the Feast of Trumpets in the Old Testament is a decidedly focused feast. And it calls the Jewish people to repentance. That is what the Feast of Trumpets is all about. And in this passage regarding the Day of the Lord, this is what God invites an unbelieving and unregenerate nation to do. Now, I want you to notice that two key words are repeated or mentioned, or mentioned three, three separate times. The word before and the word seek. Before in verse 2 and seek in verse 3. And I have those words highlighted for you uh, on the slide that, is, that appears on the screen. He calls the nation of Israel to gather back to the land. And he's speaking to a nation that I believe personally does not yet believe in their Messiah. They do not yet believe in Yeshua. And that's why it says, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. They have no shame before God because they are self-reliant for their righteousness. Because they are depending upon keeping rabbinic Judaism for their salvation. They have not repented of their sin. They have not called upon the name of the Lord. They have not believed in the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach for the forgiveness of sins. And so God calls them back to the land. And he tells them to come before the day of the Lord. Well, we know from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that the day of the Lord will not begin until sometime during the second half of the 70th 7 of Daniel. And the Jewish people have been gathering in unbelief back to the land of Israel ever since the last decade of the 19th century. This afternoon, John is going to share about Israel becoming a nation. May 14, 1948. And he's also going to talk about how the nation is going to come back to God in faith at the return of Jesus Christ. But here, they're gathering without shame before God, and he calls them back to the land before the decree takes effect, before the day passes like the chaff, before the burning anger of the Lord comes upon you before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. He gathers them back into the land in order that they might experience the day of the Lord and His purposes in that day. Now, in the Scriptures, there are 
time markers regarding the day of the Lord. Randy read one of them for you this morning. Joel chapter 2 and verse 31. There's going to be a, a, a group or a cluster of cosmic disturbances that will happen in a moment of time that will signal the imminent onset of the day of the Lord. And these are supernatural events because it talks about the sun, the moon, and the stars being impacted at the same time. So it can't be simply a lunar eclipse or a solar eclipse. It's going to be a cluster of cosmic disturbances. And, and that cosmic disturbance is going to happen before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 tells us that God is going to send Elijah to the nation of Israel before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Malachi 4, 5. There's a third passage in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, which tells us that the day of the Lord will not come until there is a great apostasy or falling away, which will be identifiable, and the Antichrist will be revealed or unveiled. And in the context, we're told that he will be revealed or unveiled when he takes his seat in the temple, displaying himself as being God. That puts it at the middle of Daniel 70th 7. It's in the middle of the week. Three and a half years into a seven-year period. Now, I share these things with you because I want to, I want to suggest a fifth marker. Cosmic disturbances, God sending Elijah, a great falling away and apostasy, and the unveiling of of the identity of the Antichrist. And that fifth marker that I want to suggest to you is actually contained here in Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 1. Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, bef bef O nation without shame, before the decree takes effect, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Now, one of the five men that I mentioned earlier is Arnold Fruchtenbaum. How many of you are familiar with his ministry? Okay, quite a few. It was probably about 11 or 12 years ago that I learned Arnold's take on Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. And I've used it in my teaching ministry ever since. Because I, I, I believe that he is correct in his understanding of this passage. Let me read the passage for you. Then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with his hand the remnant of his people who will remain from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now, in the context, and this is not a trick question, what is the context of Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12? What is the immediate context of Isaiah chapter 11, verses 11 and 12? Anybody know off the top of your head? What does Isaiah 11 talk about? If you know, say it loud. Anybody? Talks about the Messianic kingdom. All of chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 12 talks about the Messianic kingdom, all of chapter 12. So in the heart of this immediate context, 
where Isaiah is describing the messianic kingdom, we have this revelation that there are going to be two global regatherings of the nation of Israel. Because when they're gathered the second time, it's for the purposes of being gathered for the Messianic Kingdom. They were dispersed globally in 70 AD and beyond. And they've been regathered since the late 1890s back to the land. They became a political entity and nation in May of 1948. When the people came back, and as the people still go back, as Jews from around the world relocate, you know, with, with the fall of the Soviet Union, upwards of a million Jews migrated to the land of Israel in the 1990s. And, and Randy will have to tell you how many PhDs from Russia landed in Israel. You know, you wonder why so many technical and scientific advancements are being made by the nation of Israel. Part of it has to do with the fall of the Soviet Union over 25 years ago. So there's two regatherings. And notice that it talks about being regathered a second time from the four corners of the earth. So we're not talking about a regional regathering like with the Babylonian exile. This is, these are global dispersions and global regatherings. The first is ongoing, and it's an unbelief. The second will take place following the dispersion of the Jews from the land, starting with the abomination of desolation, which will be perpetrated by the man of lawlessness and the son of destruction. And they will be regathered back to the land at the end of the 70th seven when the messianic kingdom is established. This is part of the plan and the program of Almighty God for His chosen people. But I'm getting ahead of the narrative. I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. Now, this passage does not specifically mention the phrase, the day of the Lord, in the verses that I'm going to read for you. But I want you to listen carefully as I read, and I want you to listen to the language, because the language of this section of Ezekiel 20, namely verses 33 to 44, is the language of the day of the Lord. The language of the day of the Lord. Beginning with verse 33. As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I shall be king over you. And I shall bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. This is the language of the day of the Lord. This is the language of judgment. And I shall bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I shall enter into judgment with you face to face. What an incredibly terrifying time that will be for the nation of Israel. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you declares the Lord God. Now this is the second characteristic of the day of the Lord from these passages that I'm sharing from the Old Testament. The first one is, it's a time of warning. A time of warning from, 
from Zephaniah chapter 1. And as Randy shared yesterday, shared last night, this warning is in essence an expression of God's grace. Because as he warns about calamity that is to come, there is time for people to take care of business and repent of their sin. So, the second characteristic is it's a time of judgment. And it's not only a time of judgment for the nations, but it's also a time of judgment for the nation of Israel. This judgment is face to face in the wilderness. And there will be a purging, there will be a purging of the rebels and those who transgress. Look at verses 37 and 38. I shall make you pass under the rod, and I shall bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I shall purge you from you the rebels and those who transgress or sin against me. I shall bring them out of the land where they sojourn, but they will not enter the land of Israel. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. God will take care of unbelieving Jews in the wilderness who do not repent, who do not acknowledge God and his true identity, who do not seek forgiveness. And they will be summarily judged by God. And there will be a purging. But not only will there be a purging, there will also be a restoration. Look at the, the end of verse 38. Thus you will know that I am the Lord. As for you, O house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Go serve everyone his idols, but later you will surely listen to me, and my holy name you, you will profane no longer with your gifts and your idols. For on my holy mountain... Now they're in the wilderness... And they're being purged. They're passing under the, the rod of the covenant. The rebels and the transgressors are being purged. They're not going back into the land. Now he's talking about in the land, on the holy mountain. We're, we're focused on the city of Jerusalem. For on my holy mountain, on the high mountain of Israel, declares the Lord God, there the whole house of Israel. Underline this next phrase. All of them. It's going to be a remnant nation where every Jew who is alive and present on planet earth when Jesus establishes his messianic kingdom on this planet with its capital in the city of Jerusalem, every single Jew who is alive and remains will believe in their Jewish Messiah, will believe in in the Prince of Peace, will believe in the King of Kings. The whole house of Israel, all of them, will serve me in the land. There I shall accept them, and there I shall seek your contributions and the choices of your gifts with all your holy things. And as a soothing aroma, I shall accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you were scattered. And I shall prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. He'll use the nation of Israel in order to instruct the nations during the millennium. It's going to be an amazing thing. And you will know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of Israel, into the land which I swore to give to your forefathers. God promised the land to Abram. He promised the land... To Abraham's son Isaac, he promised the land to Abraham's or to Isaac's son Jacob. The three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all received the promise from God that the land belongs to the Jewish people. And while occup occupancy is is up for grabs at any point in time in history, ownership is never a question. The Jews might be scattered, they may not be occupying the land, but according to God, they own the land. God gave them that land, and he will never take it away from them. And that land will belong to them forever 
and ever and ever. By the way, uh, Ezekiel 22, 17 to 22, that's speaking of uh, a time frame in Ezekiel's time, but it uses language that is relevant for the day of the Lord. I'm not going to turn to that passage now, but it talks about uh, the, the purifying effect of a furnace uh, used to uh, purify precious metals and to burn off the dross, as it were. And, and we'll see that theme uh, picked up by other passages in just a few minutes. But I, I just share that with you as a, as a related passage from, from a language and usage point of view. Okay. Let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. And this is the, uh, by far the best known passage of the New Co Covenant found anywhere in the Bible. And these six verses are incredibly uh, powerful and they provide for us important information regarding God's dealings with the nation of Israel and what God has in view and in sight for Israel on, on the far side of the day of the Lord. Listen to verse 31 and following. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So all 12 tribes are in view here. The house of Israel and the house of Judah, God is going to make with them a new covenant. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now he's talking about the Mosaic covenant. He's talking about the old covenant that was given at Mount Sinai, which, by the way, was a conditional covenant. Not like the covenant given through Moses. It's going to be a new covenant. My covenant namely the Mosaic Covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, listen to these words in verse 34. And they shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord. There'll be none of that during the Messianic kingdom for the Jewish people. Because according to this verse, every Jew will know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's a, the, only time, the only time in history where there is a complete national conversion. I mean, today, within the body of Christ, people come to Christ as individuals. Now, there may be a group of individuals that come to Christ, but whole nations don't convert. Israel is going to be the lone exception in the future. No one understand that the new covenant is unconditional and regardless of rabbinic Judaism's rejection of the identity of Jesus Christ, regardless of the false teaching of the scribes and Pharisees during the days of our Lord at his first coming, regardless of the almost 2,000 years of blindness that rabbinic Judaism has led the people around the blind leading the blind. 
God's unconditional new covenant is still in place. It has not been abrogated. It has not been forfeited. And let me read to you God's guarantee as to why. Verses 35 through 37. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun by, for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. For thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will also cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Can any of those things be done? Yes or no? No! God is not going to reject his people. He is going to maintain his unconditional covenant as contained in the new covenant as described by Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. And I, I want you to understand the context of the new covenant. The context of the new covenant is the day of the Lord. Listen to the closing verses of Jeremiah chapter 30, beginning with verse 22. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. Behold the tempest of the Lord. Wrath has gone forth, a sweeping tempest. It will burst on the head of the wicked. The first fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has performed and until he has accomplished the intent of his heart. What is the intent of God's heart for the nation of Israel? That they might believe in him, that they might turn to him, that they might return to him in faith and genuine re repentance. That is the intent of God's heart towards his people. Now look at this last phrase. Incredible statement. In the latter days, you will understand this. This teaching of the day of the Lord is something that will not be clearly understood until we get close to the time of the end. And I think we all understand, we're close to the time of the end. And the clarity regarding the day of the Lord is becoming more and more clear. It's becoming more and more understandable. So let's continue. Zechariah chapter 13. Randy mentioned Zechariah 12. 13 and 14. My wife, Jerry, did not make this slide in the 15 minutes between our presentations. This was done on Thursday. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. It will come about in all the land, declares the Lord that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I will bring the third part through the fire, refine them as silver is refined, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. Here is the remnant nation as described by Zechariah 13. And what we're told is that two-thirds of the Jews at the time of the end will not believe. Two-thirds of the Jews at the time of the end will not enter the kingdom. It'll be a remnant. It'll be a remnant nation. One out of three, the third part, will be the ones that are refined as silver is refined and tested as gold is tested. So let me circle back to the New Covenant. The New Covenant is not only contained in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 37, 
But it's also contained in Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21. A redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, which is upon you, and my words, which I have put in your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. When the new covenant is fulfilled, when the new covenant is realized with the entire house of Israel and the entire house of Judah, God will put His Spirit in His people. And it will be an everlasting relationship. And notice that the words that he writes or puts in their hearts, writes on their hearts and puts in their mouth, combining Jeremiah 31 and Isaiah 59, will not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring. So you got three generations there. And the implication is that it's generation after generation after generation. Jews will believe in the Messianic kingdom. In contrast to generation after generation of generation of Jews who haven't yet believed in Yeshua HaMashiach the past two millennia. A Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn. Two more characteristics of the day of the Lord. It's a time of turning and repentance. A time of turning and repentance. And it's a time of new covenant, of new covenant fulfillment. Do you remember the passage from Romans chapter 11 that, that Randy shared earlier this morning? It's that passage right there. I'd like to think that great minds think alike, but it's only been established that Randy has a great mind. <laughs> but I'm working on it, and, I, and I'm on my way. Let me read this passage for you again. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul cites Isaiah 59, verses 20 and 21 there at the end. Now notice, the hardening is partial and temporary. It's not going to last forever. And it's not a complete hardening because there, there are a remnant of Jews individually who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they have down through the centuries. But as a nation, it's a partial hardening which is temporary in nature. And there'll come a, there'll come a point in time, there'll come a day when all Israel will be saved. When I read those words, theological chills up and down my arms. The hair just stands up on the back of my neck. Just thinking, thinking of God's long-suffering and patience. Thinking of the reaction of the Jewish people when they see the one whom they have pierced. And when they mourn for him, as, as one mourns over a firstborn son, as one mourns over a firstborn son who was put to death unjustly. It'll be a time of rejoicing and praise and exaltation that our planet has never seen in its history. And it's captured for us 
in the closing verses of Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Now, notice this screen. Is it different than the other screens, the other slides? The other slides were dark, gloomy, day of darkness, thick darkness. Here's the result of the day of the Lord. Sunshine and light and truth and beauty and joy and exhilaration. Listen to the words. Let me read them for you. And actually, I'm going to begin with verse 13 and read through verse 20. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they shall feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy! That's what they're going to do. They're going to shout for joy. They are going to be exhilarated in their salvation, in their acceptance by the Creator God of heaven and earth, by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You will feel the fear disaster no more. In that day it will be said to Jerusalem, Do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst. A victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden of, of them on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame. I will gather the outcast. I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in, even at that time when I gather you together. Indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth. All the peoples of the earth are turning against Israel, turning against the Jews. Anti-Semitism is rampant and out of control. But that's going to end someday. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. I'm going to take a minute or two and then we're done. Why is this important? The character and faithfulness of God is on the line. If God is not faithful to Israel, we have no reason why he should be faithful to us. The character of God and the promises of his word stand or fall with his ultimate dealings with the nation of Israel. Because he is faithful to Israel, we can be confident that he will be faithful with us. Praise God. Isaiah 66, 8 talks about a thing that is too crazy to even think about and imagine. A, a nation becoming a nation in one day. Some people point to May 14, 1948 as the fulfillment of that passage. John Haller and I disagree. John's going to share with you this afternoon why we disagree. The ultimate fulfillment is going to be when the nation of Israel, the remnant nation of Israel, embraces their Messiah the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how we thank you for this time in your word. How we thank you for such a lofty concept of your incredible patience and long-suffering towards a blind and obstinate people that you simply will not give up on. Father, we thank you 
for your covenant loyalty. We thank you for your steadfast word. Father, we thank you for the ministry of your spirit. And we pray, Father, that as we learn the things which we learned this weekend, that it might impact our lives on a practical level, that we might be better prepared to share our faith, more cognizant of your desire and will for us to live holy and blameless lives until the return of your Son. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want to apologize before Pastor Steve comes. I took five minutes of your lunch. (laughs) Guilty. Thank you. We just want to encourage you. That's really a chief aim of what we're doing here today. We love the fact that we are in a time of grace before all of the day of the Lord calamity hits. So if your heart's been tenderized by the Holy Spirit, please understand that Jesus was the perfect sacrificial substitute for you on the cross. He bore the iniquity of us all. He paid the price that we couldn't pay, and his shed blood will take away our sins. But we have got to believe in faith that he is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead. And I just want to encourage you, if the Holy Spirit's working on you, whenever you're going to watch this, please realize our heart is that we see Israel repent and believe in the gospel. And again, the glorious destiny is coming. And we are in a time of grace right now where you can cry out to Jesus and be saved from your sins. Jew or Gentile, it matters not. Jesus is our only salvation. And so we're here to proclaim that. I want to encourage you. We've got a list of local restaurants and places that you can go grab a bite to eat here. We're going to be back here at 1.30. We're going to start again. Maybe 1.35 because Mike pushed us all back five minutes just joking no be back here at you know what that means right be back here at 127 so we can get in our seats and we have more teaching to come so god bless you be safe and if you see somebody here that you don't know today give them a hug tell them thank you for coming and uh we'll see you back at 127 god bless